This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit hartmanmedia.com. Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. Welcome to the Holistic Survival Show with Jason Hartman. The economic storm brewing around the world is set to spill into all aspects of our lives. Are you prepared? Where are you going to turn for the critical life skills necessary to survive and prosper? The Holistic Survival Show is your family's insurance for a better life. Jason will teach you to think independently, to understand threats, and how to create the ultimate action plan. Sudden change or worst case scenario, you'll be ready. Welcome to Holistic Survival, your key resource for protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in uncertain times. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Holistic Survival Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we talk about protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in these uncertain times. We have a great interview for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds on the Holistic Survival Show. And by the way, be sure to visit our website at holisticsurvival.com. You can subscribe to our blog, which is totally free, has loads of great information, and there's just a lot of good content for you on the site. So make sure you take advantage of that at holisticsurvival.com. We'll be right back. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn how to finance your next big real estate deal, there's a show for that. If you want to learn more about food storage and the best way to keep those onions from smelling up everything else, there's a show for that. If you honestly want to know more about business ethics, there's a show for that. And if you just want to get away from it all and need to know something about world travel, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from jasonhartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. My pleasure to welcome Dr. Aubrey DeGray to the show. He is an expert on aging, and actually I should say aging intervention. He is a biomedical gerontologist, and he is the uh, chief science officer for the SENS Foundation. Dr. Gray, welcome. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. My pleasure. And you're coming to us from San Jose, California today, but you are based in England, I believe, right? Well, really, I'm based in both places these days. I travel from one side of the Atlantic to the other all the time, so I have a lot of miles. Fantastic. Well, aging, since the beginning of time, people have been looking for the fountain of youth. And are we getting any closer to finding it? Well, of course, it depends quite what you mean by the fountain of youth. But if we just speak generally about bringing aging under proper medical control, under, in other words, the same sort of level of medical control that we already have today over most infectious diseases, then for sure we are indeed getting closer. I would say that we are within as little as 25 years, probably. Of course, we can't be certain until it happens, but I'd say we have at least a 50-50 chance of reaching that level of control over aging within 25 years. It's just so long as the research that's going on right now is adequately funded and moves forward in a manner that is only limited by the difficulty of the science. And so when you say bringing it under medical control, the same kind of control we have infectious diseases uh, under now, finally, after all this time, what does that mean? Does that mean stopping the clock? Does it mean living to 120, 150, or, or 300 years old? Or kind of define that for us, if you would. Right. What it means is understanding and exploiting the fact that Aging is simply the collection of early stages of the diseases of old age. The reason that the diseases and disabilities of old age are of old age, in other words, that they do not affect young adults, is because they are aspects of the later stages of a process that does go on throughout life, but which is initially harmless. And that's the process we call aging. So... The types of therapy that we are likely to see in the next few decades that will bring that under control are therapies that actually repair that damage. 
in other words, restore the molecular and cellular composition and structure of the body, each individual organ and the body as a whole, back to how it was at an earlier age, in the close to early adulthood. So we would typically end up taking someone in middle age or older, maybe 60 or 70, and genuinely rejuvenating them, restoring their structure and therefore, of course, their function, both mental and physical, to how it was maybe 30 years previously. And this would be something that we would do periodically. We would certainly never be able to turn to do a one-off treatment that would make someone completely non-aging such that they would never exhibit any kind of dysfunction or disease however long they lived, even in the absence of subsequent treatments. But that's not the proposal. The proposal is a periodic treatment that repairs the damage every so often so that it doesn't continue to accumulate to a level that causes these diseases and disabilities. What is it that's causing us to age? A friend of mine talks about, and I kind of agree, that it it seems to be that our, our cells are just copy machines, and at some point they just get worn out and they don't replicate anymore. Is that the degeneration process that occurs, or is it something else? There's much more to it than that. There has to be much more to it than that, because, of course, a lot of our cells don't divide. A lot of our cells just hang out and do what they're supposed to do without dividing. All of our neurons, for example, are like that. Um, And it actually turns out that most of the problems of aging occur in those non-dividing cells. Cells that divide have certain problems, but those problems are somewhat easier to solve. Um, So, yeah, there's a lot of detail to it. There's a lot of different types of damage that happen, some of them to dividing cells, some of them to non-dividing cells, and, of course, some of them to cells in one organ, some of them a different type of damage in a different organ. But what it's all about here is simple side effects of the normal operation of the machine that we call the human body. And that is really the right way to think about aging, because that brings it down to earth. It focuses on the fact that the human body is just a machine, a ridiculously complicated machine, but still a machine. And that, and that therefore, it's no surprise that it should age in just the same way that simple man-made machines age, as a, an inevitable side effect of its normal functioning. So do you have an idea as to where this uh, uh, arresting of the aging process will come from? I mean, did we take a big leap forward when we mapped the genome? We certainly have a very good idea about where to move forward, and that's why Sense Foundation exists, because we have a particular plan, a plan that I first formulated back in 2000, and which has actually stood the test of time. After a very brief period of refinement, it's more or less been unchanged for the past decade. And this plan essentially revolves around the classification of these various types of damage that I'm talking about into a manageable number of categories such that within each category, more or less the same type of intervention, same type of treatment, should be able to repair the type of damage. There are various types of damage that we could say that they exist at the cellular level and others at the molecular level. But for each one, we have a very detailed, clear idea about what we need to do to fix it. And of course, in some cases, we're a lot closer than in other cases, but that's okay. In all cases, we know where we're going on this. So that's pretty good news. You know, we, we, we actually have a research plan a biomedical research plan that should get us to this point. Amazing. So how does that look? I mean, what what is it? Is it a is it a combination of factors or tell me about what Sens is doing? It's certainly a combination of factors, yes. So the plan that we have in terms of the classification of the types of damage we need to fix, we normally talk about seven major types of damage. And for each of those types, there's a particular research program, a particular way of fixing it. So to give you just one example, I mean, it would take me too long to go through all of them. Um, One example is cell loss. In other words, cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. This happens in various parts of the body during aging, and sometimes it is the main factor responsible for a particular type of disease. A a, A nice good example is Parkinson's disease, which is caused by the loss of cells in a particular part of the brain called the substantia nigra. And the way we fix cell loss is very simple. It's called stem cell therapy. Stem cell therapy is all about putting cells into the body that have been prepared outside in the lab into a state such that they will divide and become the types of cells that have died and not been automatically replaced. So that we restore the number of cells, the cellularity, as people call it, of the organ so that the organ still works. So, uh, okay, so so restore the cellularity, and we do this through stem cells. Talk to us a little bit about, if you would, the debate over the use of stem cells. What type of stem cells are these? Well, basically we're not, the, the debate about what type of stem cells to use is nearly over. 
I won't say it's completely over yet, but it's looking like the main problems that existed in terms of identifying cells that could do what we wanted, what we need them to do, but could be obtained in a manner that didn't, you know, conflict with certain people's ethics, that problem has gone away because we've discovered other ways of making the same cells. The big breakthrough was made five or six years ago when a group in Japan figured out how to take normal cells that weren't even stem cells at all and just what you might call de-differentiate them, turn them back into a more primitive state that was very, very similar to a regular embryonic stem cell. And this meant that we could create cells of that nature without destroying embryos. So all of the ethical debate, which was all about the need to destroy embryos, became irrelevant. Now, of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that, firstly because these cells are not precisely the same as embryonic stem cells, and therefore people are still nervous that they won't quite work as well. And secondly, because you know you may have, of course, new ethical problems for whatever um, new way you have for creating a different type of stem cell. But at the moment, it's looking like, by and large, the problem has gone away. So that's good. If that has largely gone away, then that, that's good progress. I mean, what are the big obstacles to this? You know, and I don't want to just talk about the science, the, the funding obstacles uh, of, of really speeding up the process of, of getting to the, uh, the arrest of the aging process. What do we need to do? I mean, how much money does this take? How much research? And does it come from governments, venture capital? So the scientific obstacles are certainly daunting, no question. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to belittle that. But as I say, we do have a very clear plan of action of how to move forward. And furthermore, the leading scientists around the world who are best placed to actually implement this plan, perform this work, are very hot to trot. They really want it, they're very enthusiastic about getting going on this. But yes, you're quite right. There is a third ingredient that's required. You don't just need a plan. You, just, you don't just need scientists. You also need the resources, the financing to actually do this inevitably expensive work. And that is the rate limiting step right now. I would say that over the past six or eight years since I've been talking and really ad advocating on all of this, we've probably moved forward only at about one third the amount that we could have done if funding had not been a limiting factor. And that means we've lost a lot of lives. It means we have delayed the development of these therapies. So you're quite right that it's all about how this money can be obtained. And the way I always look at it is that there are essentially three sources of money, three types of source of this money. One could be the, the private sector, venture capitalists, angel investors, and so on. But these people tend to want to make their money back quickly. They tend to want an exit strategy that's closer than 20 or 30 years, which is the sort of thing that I'm talking about. So that's a real challenge. We haven't really made much progress in getting the private sector involved, except in those areas of regenerative medicine that are much closer to market. A lot of sense, which is all about regenerative medicine, of course, a lot of sense is earlier stage than that. So then there's the government. You know, surely they're the people who are supposed to fund early stage work. But unfortunately, the difficulty there, and I'm sure you're going to want to come back to this in the rest of the interview, is that the general public are very ambivalent about aging. They don't have a good understanding about what treating aging really means and why it really is just medicine, why it really is just preventative medicine for the diseases of old age. And they're ambivalent about it. And, of course, that means there's no votes in it, and that means it's hard to get governments to do much about it. So as, this, as things stand, we have overwhelmingly received our funding from the third potential source, namely philanthropy. Okay, so philanthropy is really the biggest. That's surprising to me, by the way, because when you say the general public is uh, ambivalent about it, I mean, gosh, you look at this youth-oriented culture, and it's not just in the, in the States, but it's around the world the plastic surgery, the medi spas, the, the cosmetic industry. I mean, it's a giant, giant industry. Are you saying that the medical version of age and aging interruption is not a looks thing, it's just a health thing only? Or uh, when, when these treatments are applied to people 25 years from now, will they also look younger or just internally be and feel younger? So first of all, to answer that last part, Absolutely. When we get these therapies working, people will not only, will will look and feel and function just like young adults. It'll be the whole. It'll be the real McCoy, the real deal, the whole package. But to answer your question about ambivalence, the thing here is that people seem to be 
happy with the idea that it would be good to age more a bit more slowly to actually be unusually healthy for your age and then to you know to to kill over in your sleep at the age of 95 without too much pain they're up for that but when we talk about doing the job properly actually bringing aging completely under medical control then there is, there is an extraordinarily ubiquitous knee-jerk reaction to think in terms of longevity as the point, you know, of, you know, what would I do with all that time, or, I, you know, how would we pay the pensions, or where would we put all the people, or wouldn't dictators live forever? These are the things that dominate people's thinking, rather than the fact that, hello, we've got a problem today of people getting sick and suffering enormously as a result of aging. So, I think really the job for people like me, and indeed for anyone who's interested in, in promoting this mission, so someone like you, for example, who's taking the trouble to have me on the radio, you know, the job for us is to educate people to understand that this is just preventative medicine for aging, for the diseases of old age. If you don't want to get Alzheimer's, then this is the sort of research that you want to make happen and happen sooner rather than later. If you don't want to get cardiovascular disease, it's the same research that we need to hasten. It seems that, you know, I never thought of the aspect of won't dictators live forever. That's a bit of a scary one, you're right, because ultimately their regimes regimes tumble because they die. And, you know, many times the new the new people that take over are uh, not as bad as the one who left. That's, a, that's an interesting point. But, you know, in terms of the pension issue, I mean, that's certainly something that, that people would initially think. But if they're feeling younger, looking younger, truly being younger, won't they just work longer? Well, first of all, I want to come back to you on the dictator thing. I didn't say the dictator thing was scary. I think it's one of the most unreasonable reasons to, to get all of this. The fact is, you know, dictator does come fairly high on the on the league. Of risk. Um, I, I'm not that concerned about it. I just thought it was interesting that you even brought it up. I, I never, it never even occurred to me. I brought it up because other people bring it up, not because I think it makes any kind of sense. It makes no sense. Uh, pensions, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a reason why we uh, we feel as a society that it's reasonable to pay people a reasonable amount of money to do nothing from the age of 65. The reason we think that's a sensible thing to do is because we're very sorry for people who are over 65. And the reason we're sorry for them is because they're about to die. So the whole social contract completely changes, has to be rebuilt from square one when people's r- amount of remaining healthy life is no longer related to how long they've been alive so far, which is what we're talking about. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's all about that social contract. So that changes the issue of the pensions. I guess the I guess the people that would really have a problem is is the environmentalist, you know, who think that people are destroying the planet. That would be the group that I think would be maybe the big objection, right? Well, so you're quite right that there's an enormous amount of opposition based on the problem of, or the perceived problem of overpopulation, which is ultimately what any environmental concern comes down to. It's okay. It's fine to have 7 billion people on the planet. The problem is there are 7 billion people, each of whom is doing significant damage to the planet. So then we have to ask a few things. We have to say, well, first of all, how do we know that's not going to change? You know, supposing 50 years from now we have nuclear fusion as the main source of energy. So then suddenly people have a tiny fraction of their current carbon footprint, and that will make a significant difference to how much damage we do to the planet. We also don't know how many children people are going to want to have. We know that fertility rates are going down all the time. We also know that people, are, women are having their children later on average all the time. And of course, when we don't have menopause anymore, which is one thing that's going to happen, then people can have their children later and later without any risk of any kind of genetic abnormality and so on. So there's an awful lot of specifics there that we have to take into account and when we evaluate the potential magnitude of any problem of this nature. But also, we have to remember that today, we have already a world in which we are making the choice to have fewer kids than we used to simply because kids are surviving. 200 years ago, when people were pioneering the idea of hygiene saving lives, it was rather successful. Um, You know, we went down from having literally 40% of babies dying before the age of one down to a tiny proportion, like, you know, one or 2%. And If you put yourself back in that, supposing you were Louis Pasteur, standing up in front of a general audience of the general public, and you said, I've got this way of stopping all this infant death. And everyone cheers, and then some some troublemaker at the back says, hang on, hang on, there's going to be a terrible overpopulation problem, isn't there? Because all these 
everyone turns around and they ask you what they ask you how what your answer is. And if you say it's going to be fine, everyone is going to submit to this barbaric indignity of wearing all these rubber contraptions whenever they have sex. You know, they're not going to believe you. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Or you know, or the same with Joseph Lister or anybody who's discovered ways to save or prolong lives. But you know, that actually leads to sort of an interesting question: Is are we? I mean. If you look in the past and you look at, th- there are many people in antiquity, or at least hundreds of years ago, that lived to be 80, 90 years old. Are we really living any longer or are we just dying less? Because when you look at the hygiene issue and the malaria issues and things like that, those aren't killing people off as much. But the, the actual top lifespan, I wonder if it's really gone up at all. I guess, I guess the oldest person has been or is now about 120. Is that correct? So you're absolutely right that the, at least we can't, we, can't necessarily, we can't necessarily say that there has been no increase. But we can certainly say that the increase in maximum lifespan is much less than the increase in average lifespan. Because we have made the greatest impact on diminishing early deaths. The question is what we can learn from this. I think what it tells us is only that the interventions we've developed so far, whether they be actual bona fide medical interventions or whether they be just uh, lifestyle and prosperity interventions that allow people to have a better diet and so on, those interventions have made only a modest impact, if any, on the aging process. And since they've only had a modest impact, we haven't seen extensive increase in the maximum lifespan. But that tells us nothing at all about what we could expect to see in terms of increase of maximum lifespan when we develop new medicines that we haven't, ha- haven't got yet. There's every reason to believe that medicines can, in principle, be developed which will extend healthy lifespan and therefore, as a side effect, total lifespan vastly more than anyone's achieved so far. What, what will happen, I mean, I know that you don't know the answer to this yet, but what might happen to one's brain as they are, you know, as the aging process being reversed, maybe you, you roll the clock back 30 years, but do they still have all the same memories and experience? You know, I, I, I mean, you know, I would easily say I would love to be 22 again, knowing everything I know now. And I think a lot of people have felt that way. <laughs> but, I, but I don't necessarily want to be 22 again, knowing what I knew when I was actually 22. <laughs> I, I love the wisdom that comes with uh, a few years, for sure. Exactly. And I, I assure you that we are not proposing to eliminate people's wisdom and, uh, and take them back to, being, to knowing what they did when they were a young adult. The idea here is that memory is a plastic thing already. Memory and uh, every aspect of one's personality and one's wisdom and so on is stored in the brain in a very distributed way so that, you know, there's not, there's not like one fact is stored in one neuron or in one synaptic connection. That means that if we were to maintain the structure and, and, and composition of the brain indefinitely in a youthful state, there would continue to be this equilibrium where we learn, more, we learn new things as we experience them and we forget other things. But we don't forget everything, of course, because when we recall a memory, that process reinforces the memory. So the things we forget are things that we learned a long time ago, but also we have not, they have not been relevant to our lives, so we haven't been recalling them. And that's sort of okay. You know, I mean, I can't remember half the names of the people I went to school with, but I know that doesn't bother me. So we can imagine that as time goes on, however long we live, there will continue to be this equilibrium. There will be this spectrum of, how long ago something happened that we remember and that spectrum will become more and more spread out but the things we remember are the things that we want to remember so it's really not something to be concerned about well what else should people know about this you know i guess maybe i'd like to definitely get this question in before you go what do you think the treatments will be i mean will they be some sort of machine a magic pill something that you do over time maybe by ingesting something in your digestive system what will happen i mean how might these treatments come about? This is likely to change over time, actually. It's likely not to be um, something obvious from the beginning. 
right at the beginning when these therapies become available, uh, a, a large part of it may involve surgery. It may involve replacing whole organs with artificial organs, for example. However, I'm pretty sure that after not very long at all, maybe a decade or so, the therapies will have been improved to the point where it can all be done in a much less invasive way. So stem cell therapies, which essentially involves injection into the bloodstream, gene therapies, which also are done typically by injection into the bloodstream, you have, have in this case, engineered viruses usually, things like that. And indeed, some of it, and indeed an increasing amount of it, may just be done by oral administration, as you say, whether by whether those sorts of things or also vaccines or other more straightforward um, pharmaceutical interventions. But the, the mode of delivery is going to uh, is going to change over time, and it's going to change in the direction of becoming more and more convenient, and less and less invasive. Of of all the things that are out now, whether it be vitamin supplements or diet in general or anything else out there, is there any sort of anti-aging treatment today? I mean, HGH, different supplementation and things like that. Are any of these things legitimate or are they all just sort of skirting the issue? I think skirting the issue is probably the right phrase because these things, I wouldn't call them all illegitimate, but they definitely don't get to the root of aging. You don't live 20 years longer or even you know, five years longer as a result of any of these therapies, unless in, of course, some people are just unlucky. They're aging unusually rapidly. And there, there's reasonable evidence that in many cases, we can somewhat normalize the person's rate of aging by simple interventions. But if you're already normal, or even, especially if you're already doing better than normal, then at this point, we can pretty much say that there is nothing that will significantly make you better still. And that's why the priority has to be to do whatever we can to hasten the development of therapies we don't yet have. How, how do you know if you're aging at a normal rate or if you're above or below normal? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and of course, at one level, we just don't know because the, 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 the aging is such a complicated thing with so many ways in which you might die that in order to decide whether you have what your biological age is, what you're doing is essentially arbitrarily combining a whole bunch of numbers that are semi-independent into one number as if they were as, as if that meant something. But still. One can certainly look at all the various things we know about that typically change with age um, in, people, in everyone and ask, you know, where are you on that spectrum? Are you average for someone your age or are you average for someone younger or are you average for someone older? And one can get a general idea. I've, heard, I've certainly had such tests and I'm very pleased to say that for almost all of them I come out you know, looking biologically younger than, that, than my chronological age. It must, it, you know, it, it, it's not a really robust, rigorous, statistically meaningful thing, but it's still an indication. And, and in the meantime, you can go to websites like realage.com, right? <laughs> Again, not very hardcore, but, but interesting to some extent. Do you have anything to say about that? Sure. Like that, or indeed, even much more high-end tests that one would have. For me, it's not that number that number that you get out at the, at the end that matters. What matters is the individual data, the, um, the specific measurements, the raw data, shall we say, the, uh, about the various components of aging, because those things will tell you something, at least, about your risk of particular types of aging, particular aspects of aging that can lead to particular diseases that you might die of. Sure. Very good. Well, Dr. Aubrey de Grey, thank you so much for this insight today. This is something that we will all be looking forward to and, and hoping that the future brings great things for life extension and, and quality of life extension uh, as well. Give out your website, if you would, and tell people where they can learn more. Sure. Um, yes, I would love the audience to go to our website, sense.org, S-E-N-S, S for sugar, E-N-S for sugar, dot O-R-G. And we have uh, not only the basic information about what the charity does, what we, um, what, what work we fund, but also a whole bunch of answers to all the questions you might have about the science and also about the social context of all of this. Also, of course, going there will allow you to contact us directly, send me an email, uh, generally get involved. And, of course, if you are so minded, to uh, contribute financially. We're, we're a charity. We're a 501c3, so any U.S. citizen gets tax relief on anything they give us. And, of course, that's how we manage to do what we do. Fantastic. Well, keep up the good work out there, and thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me on the show. I've never really thought of Jason as subversive, but I just found out that's what Wall Street considers him to be. Really? Now, how is that possible at all? Simple. Wall Street believes that real estate investors are dangerous to their schemes 
because the dirty truth about income property is that it actually works in real life. I know. I mean, how many people do you know, not including insiders, who created wealth with stocks, bonds, and mutual funds? Those options are for people who only want to pretend they're getting ahead. Stocks and other non-direct traded assets are a losing game for most people. The typical scenario is you make a little, you lose a little, and spin your wheels for decades. That's because the corporate crooks running the stock and bond investing game will always see to it that they win. This means unless you're one of them, you will not win. And unluckily for Wall Street, Jason has a unique ability to make the everyday person understand investing the way it should be. He shows them a world where anything less than a 26% annual return is disappointing. Yep, and that's why Jason offers a one-book set on creating wealth that comes with 20 digital download audios. He shows us how we can be excited about these scary times and exploit the incredible opportunities this present economy has afforded us. We can pick local markets untouched by the economic downturn, exploit packaged commodities investing, and achieve exceptional returns safely and securely. I like how he teaches you how to protect the equity in your home before it disappears, and how to outsource your debt obligations to the government. And this set of advanced strategies for wealth creation is being offered for only one hundred and ninety-seven dollars. To get your Creating Wealth Encyclopedia Book One, complete with over twenty hours of audio, go to jasonhartman.com/store. If you want to be able to sit back and collect checks every month, just like a banker. Jason's Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series is for you. Thank you for joining us today for the Holistic Survival Show, protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in uncertain times. Be sure to listen to our Creating Wealth show, which focuses on exploiting the financial and wealth creation opportunities in today's economy. Learn more at www.jasonhartman.com or search Jason Hartman on iTunes. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, offering very general guidelines and information. Opinions of guests are their own, and none of the content should be considered individual advice. If you require personalized advice, please consult an appropriate professional. Information deemed reliable, but not guaranteed.